What is up, guys? Welcome back to Return of Each Farm. My dog, I don't know if you can hear that, but he's over there drinking loudly from his water bowl because, because obviously, um, well, he's doing it because he's thirsty and he's a dog, but it seems to always happen when I turn the camera on. So I wanna welcome you here to my table at Return of Each Farm. If you're new here, my name is Jess. I'm so glad that you're here. If you're not new here, I'm also glad that you're here. Um, today, I am doing a little seed haul, um, an un an unbagging, it's not an unboxing, this isn't a box, of seeds uh, from in my gardener. And I decided I would turn on the camera and share it with you because I love you and friends don't open seeds without sharing with their friends, right? Uh, probably gonna be a little bit on the longer end. This isn't a massive seed order, but you might wanna go ahead and grab your tea and coffee and let's sit for a while. I love doing videos like this because I can tell you why I order things, what I do with them, and maybe give you some inspiration. Hold on, I need some scissors. All right, so it is getting to be the time of year to order your garden seeds. Um, yesterday was my birthday. Thank you so much for all the kind birthday wishes. You guys really made me feel special. I really appreciate that. And Christmas is next week. So for years, um, before I had the YouTube channel where I had a lot of people that sent me seeds and different things like that, I would use my birthday and Christmas money to buy seeds. I mean, I remember like the first heirloom seed order I put in was, I mean, at this point it's been about 15 years ago. And um, it was with, I had gotten $50 for my birthday. I spent the whole thing on seeds. And so to me now, this is like, the seed time of year. You can wait to buy your seeds, but I will tell you when you're buying, especially from these smaller businesses that might have limited stock, you do risk certain things being out of stock if you wait until like seed starting time to actually order things. So I like to start ordering seeds like early December and through December. So I've already started to think about my garden next year and get all of this stuff in, which of course is, is heavily playing into my garden for next year. This is not necessarily everything that I'm planning on growing next year. I do tend to maybe order a little extra. I tend to get a little carried away now because I love sharing the love in that vein. I'm going to pick two people on my email list next week. I'm gonna send a $50 in my gardener gift card to two different people on my email list. So if you're not already signed up for my email list, make sure you sign sign up there and we'll just go through and randomly pick two people um, that'll get an email with a gift card because I love to share the seed love. Um, I will say, I think the place where I feel the most awestruck at my very cool life, being able to do YouTube the way that I do and being able to have so much in in terms of like gardening things and seeds and all that stuff it is it is seeds my friend daniel was here last week and he was like do you remember when you used to um you know just take everything you had to be able to buy like 50 dollars worth of seeds and you would just agonize over what you chose he's like isn't this crazy abundance and it is this is crazy abundance so i love to get to share that and I also love to share why I'm doing what I'm doing, why I'm buying where I'm buying, because I, I like reviews and I like knowing uh, what other people think of different businesses, different varieties, different things, how they did in their garden. I will tell you, whenever you are listening to people talk about seed varieties, I want to encourage you to always take that advice not as a black and white law or a rule that must be followed, but just information that you're gonna weigh in when you make a decision. Even stuff that I say, like if I say, this really didn't grow well for me, unless you are growing down the street from, from me, that might not mean that it's not gonna grow well for you. There are, there are local factors that are gonna play into how your garden grows. Also, skill level in gardening. Like there are people who've told me, well, that, that did terribly for me, and then I grew it and loved it, and it did really well. So if you know someone to be a very experienced gardener that's probably not making beginner mistakes, you could obviously take their advice maybe a little more freely, but even still, there are localized factors. I do not believe that you have to buy local seeds for them to thrive. There are going to be heirlooms and varieties that were developed for your region 
that are probably going to do better. For instance, um, I lived in Arkansas and the Arkansas Traveler Tomato was one that was developed for that region. The thing was is that I didn't really love the Arkansas Traveler Tomato. In my garden in Arkansas, it typically outlived some of the other tomatoes because it was more resistant to the humidity and the diseases that were kind of caused by the humidity of that area and it, it did better but the tomato itself was not something that I was excited about so I would grow it and I would have tomatoes longer because of it which was good but I still grew a lot of things that might even have died earlier in the season due to the blight and the funguses due to the humidity uh, because I wanted them and so now I have a handful of heirlooms that we've sourced locally here in South Carolina. M my um, employee and friend Will is really into local heirlooms and he's brought some seeds in. That he got from a, a local man named Dr. Kibler that has stewarded multiple heirlooms here that have come down through hundreds of years and really cool stuff. They do amazing but I'm still going to grow things from seeds I get elsewhere because it interests me. So again, I want you as you're seed shopping to kind of like not be in that black and white place of I have to get local stuff. Just because you buy seeds from a person locally doesn't mean that they didn't pay a grower that lived across the country to grow them. Um, some, maybe, yeah, and if you can save seeds out of your own garden, that's great. You're going to end up with more resistant plants, but that to me does not weigh out the benefit of the variety and the beauty and the wonderful things you get to experience by trying lots of different things. I love In My Gardener's seed company. Luke has become a personal friend of mine. We met because both being content creators uh, years ago. I remember meeting him for the first time at Homesteaders of America, I think in 2018, if I remember correctly. And he is precious. His wife is precious. They have a precious family. I love the fact that he has branched into a seed business. I know he does a lot of good for the gardening community. Yes, you can buy seeds at a lot of different places. You can can go buy seeds at the dollar store. You can buy seeds at big box stores. You can buy them from all different companies. A lot of people will ask, well, I want to make sure I get the non-GMO seeds. GMO seeds are not legal to sell on a consumer level. Now there's a lot you could go down that road and yes, there is cross-pollination. There are all these different things, but for the most part, like, I mean, if you're going to go buy a package of seeds, you don't have to worry about that seed package being GMO. There are a lot of people say, well, I want it sustainable. So I have to get heirlooms. And it is true that if you want to be able to isolate a blossom, save seeds from something and get a fruit that is going to have seeds in it that is just like the parent plant, you want to do heirlooms. But that's also possible with open pollinated hybrids. And the bottom line is, is if you're really, really concerned about sustainability, just learn to be a really good gardener because you could get food out of any seeds if you are a good gardener. All of that said, the places I love to buy seeds from are places like In My Gardener because I like supporting companies that are overall bringing value to the gardening community. So there are a lot of places like the big box stores. I'll grow those seeds, you know, and I, I get given those. I might buy a pack here and there. But for the most part, that's a big corporation. And though there might be some efforts that they're doing off in the wings that are helping the community, when I look at somebody like Luke, that's a family run business running this, creating tons of content. He has a YouTube channel. It's one of the original gardening YouTube channels in my gardener. Um, and he's, he's teaching gardening and bettering the community and also providing a really good product at a solid price. So all the seed package, most all of the seed packages on In My Gardener are $2. Um, and they have a pretty good amount of seeds in them, enough for the home gardener. I mean, you're not using, if you're getting a seed package that has 40 tomato seeds, you're probably not using all of these. And I would say, let me find a tomato here. I know I'll want some. Paul Robeson is one of my favorites. Oh, well, you know what? This probably has 40 tomato seeds in it. Um, 15, 20, yeah. This has about 40 tomato seeds in it. $2. Most home gardeners are not going to grow all 40 of these plants, which means that even at $2 a pack, you could potentially get together with a local friend, split an order, and then, you know, get some baggies and split these and save even more money. Uh, Luke does provide a coupon code for my viewers. It's Jess. 
10 and it'll take 10% off of your order, which makes it a dollar and 80 cents package, which is even better. Another thing I want to note about this packaging, which this is new actually, I think they just reworked this because they used to have more paper packaging and now they're like a, I don't know if you can kind of see, they're kind of like a slicker shinier, which I like that. I think they'll hold up better and probably be a little more resistant if they get a few water drops on them. And I've always appreciated the fact that the information on MI Gardener seed packages is really easy to understand. I commiserate with people who write seed package information. I mean, how hard is that? You've got, you've got, you know, like three by four inches to tell people how to grow something that I couldn't do it. I'm way too long winded. I really appreciate on the plant spacing. This says like 18 to 36 inches for this tomato. So many seed packages, the plant spacing is based on farmish agriculture, not a home garden type layout. So they'll say like four foot rows and 36 inches between plants. I grow in raised beds. And when I first started gardening, I would read those and be like, how the heck am I supposed to do that? And it really wasn't necessary. A lot of times you see those three foot, four foot rows that are on seed packets. And that's considering um, farming equipment and tillers and stuff like that. Like I don't use that stuff in walkways. And so what I like about these in my gardener seed packages and this is what luke teaches like he talks about like intensive planning and um he calls it i think on center spacing so essentially like if it says 18 to 36 inches you've got your plant and just you need 18 to 36 inches um around it and that to me makes so much more sense so 18 to 36 if i've got it in the middle if i've got 18 inches on each side then i have enough space for that plant does that make sense i appreciate that and i think that again when i'm when i say like don't let it be black and white when you are reading a seed package trying to figure out how to plant something especially if you're getting them from a place that is not necessarily trying to educate gardeners Again, those big box stores, those big companies, they're throwing that information on there just kind of out of obligation. But then the people like us who are actually teaching people how to garden are having to kind of decipher that and explain it. And I can appreciate in my gardener seed packages because as a person who's trying to decipher and explain it, he's made it a lot clearer. All right, so let's hop in here. These are all kind of mixed together. Maybe I should separate them by type so that I can kind of stay on the same topic. I'm gonna do that real quick. All right, you wanna see this? All right, check that out. Isn't that a lovely thing to behold? You wanna go outside? So as I said, this is not everything that I'm gonna grow in the spring, but I will likely grow all of these. I've got a lot of peppers and tomatoes here, and I won't grow every seed in this, this order, but I will grow some of everything in this order. So let's start with the herbs. This is an order that I place that is largely things that I have grown before and that I know I like. I'm a little bit of a hodgepodge gardener and I tend to grow things that I find either interesting or beautiful. And I love trying new things because it keeps me motivated to go back to the garden. Uh, prior to getting into the world of heirlooms and all of the amazing variety that Frankly, we just don't get exposed to anymore. Like when you go in the grocery store, you might see like three different kinds of tomatoes, but they all, you know, largely look the same, pretty much red tomatoes. When I first started growing yellow and orange and purple tomatoes and white tomatoes and green tomatoes and all these different things, I remember so many people were like, don't you have any regular tomatoes? And I'm like, why is red regular? Like, why can't they all be normal? But because the way that seed companies are and because the way that plant companies are like when you go buy plant starts most plant starts you buy at big box stores in the spring are all started by the same company and they have a bottom line so they might have a few heirloom varieties but for the most part you've got hybrids and you've got the same handful of varieties at every store because it just doesn't make financial sense for them to start 50 different types of tomatoes because a lot of people won't buy them uh, so they have to stick to what sells i get that but for me, jumping into heirlooms and I say growing something lovely, which captivated my heart, was the motivation I needed to really do the hard work of the garden. The garden's hard work and it was, it was a new thing for me whenever I first started. That's why you see a lot of variety here. It doesn't necessarily make the most sense to do it like this if you're trying to go after the most efficiency. 
but I'm not. I'm doing the garden to get food for my family and to be a hobby and a passion. So this makes perfect sense for me. So I got some lemon balm seeds. I actually do not have a spot in my garden of lemon balm currently. At my old house, I did have a bed, and lemon balm is one of those things, it's a cousin to mint, it's in the mint family, um, and mint is known to be very aggressive. Lemon balm is a very aggressive plant. It's hard to get rid of once you get it established. So this is gonna go in a small raised bed where I can have it from now on. I do have a blog post talking about using lemon balm to make what we call honey medicine. It's what my son called it whenever it was really little. But uh, you basically steep lemon balm down and you add honey and make kind of like a calming syrup. One of lemon balm's medicinal properties is to be calming. It's something that people use for anxiety and to help uh, bring about rest and just an overall sense of peace. And so um, this is something I really would just like to have back in my garden. Plus it smells amazing. It has a lot of other medicinal properties too. Uh, but what we've used it for is for that calming and you can take you can take that honey medicine Which is that steep lemon balm added to honey and if you wanted to just use that as like a drink You could add that if you have like LaCroix or soda water or something like that You can add like a tablespoon or however much you want however sweet you like it I don't like super sweet stuff But a little bit of that to like a soda water and make like a natural soda and you can do that with any herb Like you could steep any you know edible herb down add honey or sweetener and then use that to sweeten and make a drink at home uh, Chamomile I actually do have an area of chamomile but this is something that I'm gonna start and probably sell plant starts of in the spring. Chamomile is also one of those things, very heavily medicinal uh, for calming, easing anxiety. Frankly, we live in a world that is just like very stimulating with all the screens and all of the connection and the contact with people. So when I can find herbal things that help ease the nerves and maybe like just support your nervous system, I really like that. So that's why I got more chamomile seeds and holy basil, so this is Tulsi. Now there are a few different strands of holy basil, different varieties. For years, I've grown holy basil and I'll do garden tours and I'll talk about how it's my favorite smell in the garden. It is, it's amazing. And I've had people say, I grew it and it really didn't smell that good to me. And there are varieties that do not smell as good. The one that in my gardener carries, this holy basil, is the one that I grow in my garden. That is amazing, is in my gardener's holy basil. Um, this, the first time I ever grew holy basil was from in my gardener seeds. I mean, if you grow it once, it's gonna reseed everywhere. You'll have it popping up year after year. I have it, it'll pop up in spring, but I'm still gonna go ahead and start some. Another thing, um, the rest of these herbs that I got, I got the, the Tulsi, which is what holy basil is also called, but I got multiple other different basil varieties and I'll line them out. But I have another blog post talking about making basil tea. And that is why I am planning on lots of basil varieties this year is because my friend Taylor showed us how to make basil tea this last summer. And it will be a staple in my house until the end of time. Many of you made it and loved it. It's crazy cool. And it's neat that the different varieties of basil, which you can just use like a plain old Genovese basil and make basil tea but we love the holy basil one. And again, it does have medicinal properties. So Tulsi, and then the other basils that I got was mammoth. I have not made tea out of mammoth basil. I like growing mammoth basil to use the leaves on sandwiches, in salads, and to do like lettuce wraps. So to make up like a lettuce wrap in a big basil leaf, it's really, really good. And if you're not eating bread, like it's a good way to replace bread. Um, Thai basil, that's one we made tea from that was really good. Lemon basil, another one that we made tea from that was really good. It tastes, it has like a lemon head taste to it. This would be one good to make tea if you mixed it with lemon balm. Lemon balm and lemon basil together would make really good tea. Licorice basil, this was one I wanted to try for tea. Because you hear like, cinnamon or licorice or lemon or whatever these different basils and then you eat it and you're like yeah i can kind of taste that when you make tea you're like wow this really has a licorice taste wow this really has a lemon taste it's pretty cool another thing you can do and i've done this in the past is at the end of the season which you don't have to wait till the end of the season that's when i did it because i was just getting everything out of the garden i take all the basil plants cut them down and hang them to dry and then mix it together 
And one year for Christmas, I gave out little jars of, I think I called it like five basil blend, and it was like five different varieties of basil. So you had some that were more um, herbaceous, some that were sweeter, some that were more flowery, whatever, different hints of flavor. And that was so good. I don't even remember what the varieties were. So I, I it's kind of one of those things. Well, I, I'm glad you like it, but you might never have it again. And I've broken up different basils since then, but that one year, I wish I knew. I wish I had written down what all varieties were in that. And then the last one, I got this dwarf Greek basil. I grab little dwarf plants and seeds because I love growing in green stalks to show people what you can do if you live like in an apartment or a patio home or you know you just you can't put in a garden but you have the ability to do containers and I like trying different dwarf varieties because I love how they do in the green stalk so that's why I grabbed that. I also got some nasturtium which I'll kind of talk about those in line with the herbs. Nasturtium is a flower. These this is the jewel mix nasturtium. All parts of this the nasturtium plant are edible and uh, you can eat the flowers you can eat the leaves the different colors taste slightly different they have kind of like a wasabi kick to them like they're just a little spicy and so one of the things i like to do is take like a bunch of nasturtium leaves roll them up and slice them real thin and mix that in with salads um, we'll mix it in with like fish tacos and then of course the flowers are just beautiful as a garnish but you can eat them and Nasturtium is also a really good trap crop. So if you want to do companion planting and diverse planting, any variety of nasturtium is great because I have had multiple times where the pests run to the nasturtium and leave the stuff around it alone. So I sprinkle it all over the garden. You can eat it. It's beautiful. It serves a purpose and it doesn't take up that much space. There are trailing varieties of nasturtium. The jewel mix is not one. The, I think that there may be a jewel climbing, but it should say climbing, trailing, climbing, vining, something like that if it is one of those varieties. If it says nothing, assume that it's not um, because more nasturtiums are bushes than are vines. They won't denote it if it's just normal. This, the plant size says 12 inches. That's another way to tell. So if you look at the plant size on a plant, you're trying to figure out, is this a trailing variety? It'll say like three to four feet if it is, and it'll say like 12 to 18 inches if it's not. So that one's not. Since I mentioned flowers, I only got two flowers on this. I got two different types of zinnias. The Isabellina, which is soft, buttery, yellow blooms. And then the Green Envy, which is a vivid, bright green. I have never grown the yellow one before. I had a really beautiful buttery yellow zinnia come once, I guess it was in a mix, and then it reseeded the next year. So I had this beautiful yellow zinnia uh, come up in my garden that I loved. And when I saw this, I was like, I think that may be it. I'm not sure if it is, but I loved those yellow flowers. They looked so pretty in arrangements with sunflowers and they were just very cheerful. I love yellow flowers. They're so happy. And then the bright green, I find that the envy zinnias that are bright green, they are such a nice kick in summer arrangements because you have all these other bright colors and the green just kind of works nicely in that. Next, um, green globe artichokes. We'll say these because this is technically a flower. An artichoke is a flower that you harvest before the head opens up. So um, if you leave this, it opens up into a really fabulous like it's purple spiky looking flower. I have a handful of artichoke plants already growing in my high tunnel, uh, which were started from seeds. These are just going to be started as well. And I think we may put some outside the high tunnel and just see how they do. You can grow artichokes down to pretty cold, let's see, perennial in zone seven to 10. And this is again, I love in my gardener's packaging because instead of just saying zone seven to 10, it says perennial zones. And just because something says zone seven to 10 does not mean that you cannot attempt to grow it in zone six. You can, it's what this is saying is it's not gonna be perennial. The, your winter in zone six is gonna kill this plant. What that means is, is if you're going to attempt to grow this in a colder zone, you are going to have to start it earlier, protect it more, and potentially protect it over winter. That doesn't mean you have to heat, grow a heated greenhouse ne necessarily. Maybe just like a cold frame, maybe protecting that plant with some sort of cover. I think it's worth a try. I did grow artichokes in zone seven 
in Arkansas. I'm in zone eight now, and so we have them growing. We have them in the high tunnel, but they will do fine, I believe, out of the high tunnel. Where next? Got one lone lettuce. I have a lot of lettuce seeds as well. I didn't buy a whole lot of these, but I thought this was really pretty. And again, I had done, this is called a uh, prize head leaf lettuce. See that picture? I mean, I've grown so many different lettuces and to me, they're all fairly similar. Like I've had a few I really didn't like, but for the most part, like if, if you grow lettuce and it tastes bad, it's more likely that it was too warm for it or it didn't get enough water. So if you've grown lettuce and you're like, man, my lettuce tasted terrible, like try growing it through like a cooler time of year. For me, in zone eight where it gets really hot in the summer, I grow lettuce through the winter and it's great. We harvest lots of lettuce. When it starts getting warm, I don't because it's very hard to grow it and it tastes like much when it's hot outside or it just will go to seed. But I remember having one that looked like this that I had bought, like I started plant somewhere. And so when I saw this, I thought that looks really similar to that variety I had. And sometimes, you know, you end up with varieties that somebody gives you some seeds or you buy a plant or something volunteers and you don't know exactly what it is. Well, you know, you can try other things until you find something that's similar. This is the only thing other than like the herbs, basil's frost tender, lemon balm and chamomile are not frost tender. So I could start those pretty soon. Um, under a light with some heat until they got to be like more substantial plants and then put them out. I have chamomile growing out in the garden right now. Those will be fine. Basil will have to, it'll have to be after any chance of frost that I move it out. Artichokes are not frost tender. Um, I've got artichokes out there growing. I mean, a really hard freeze will kill them back, but it's gotten down to like 20 something and I haven't killed them here. Nasturtium is frost tender. So some of the things I just showed you, I'll probably start in January. When I'll, I'm gonna start starting seeds in January in the greenhouse where I can keep them pretty protected. I won't start anything frost tender until like late February and then I will have to heat the greenhouse at that point. Or you could start it in your house under a light. The rest of the things I have here frost tender so there'll be things started later except for these these are all root vegetables i've got hailstone radishes which is a small white radish i'll get back to this a sparkler white tip radish which is round it's kind of similar to a french breakfast but round instead of oblong and then i've got american purple top rutabagas and golden detroit beets where i live I could potentially go out right now and direct sow seeds for root vegetables. They would grow really slowly and I probably would not harvest much until March or April. Now normally these things like during the normal season grow in less than a month, but because there's so much less light and there's so much less warmth, it might take three or four months to get them to harvest size. That being the case, I probably won't put these in the ground. What I normally do at this point is I have stuff in the ground that's already growing. As long as the ground is not frozen, I'll, I will start putting these seeds in the ground in like mid to late February. Our last frost here is in like early to mid April. So six to eight weeks before your last frost, as long as your ground is workable, you can put frost hardy seeds in the ground, namely root vegetables, carrots. Oh, I lied. The rest is not frost hardy because I had carrots laying there. So they go with these. You can put these chamomile, uh, calendula, sweet peas, sweet peas. There's also these. <laughs> um, snap peas, sweet peas, and onions. I don't know what I'm talking about. Y'all just ignore all of that about the rest being frost hardy. This is, I think now, accurate. Um, you could direct sow all of these things in like six to eight weeks before your last frost. The onions, I will not direct sow. I'm actually going to start these in the greenhouse and try to move them out. These are the crystal white wax variety. It's a southern heirloom and the reason I purchased this one, even though I already have a lot of onion sets out there that I've already put in, um, it says that it's been used in pickling for decades and so my thought with this is, it was appealing to me, it says this variety packs tons of flavor in its tiny globes. So my thought for this was to start it indoors, move them out, and then harvest them when they were small and pickle small onions because I like those. The rest of these things, the spring blush peas, the black nebula carrots, and then the roots that I mentioned, uh, I will direct sow all of these six to eight weeks before my last frost for my spring things. For us, if I wait until 
there's no chance of frost to put these things in the ground, there's a very good chance it's gonna get too warm for these to thrive before they hit maturity. So I have to put them in early. If you live in a place that does not routinely exceed like 85 degrees Fahrenheit, 26, 27 Celsius in the summer, you could grow this stuff all year. You live like in a cooler climate place. And if you live in a place like that, you're likely not living in a place that you can grow anything over the winter. But for me, I have to use my winter season to grow frost hardy things because it's just too hot for them in the summer. I'm gonna say hi, William. William, do you like seeds? <laughs> go on, sir. I do wanna say, before we go on to the warmer garden things, I wanna give a little nod to the root vegetables. I think root vegetables have just gotten a really bad rap from people that don't know how to cook them. Root vegetables are pretty easy to grow. Now, every, I say that and people are like, mine never grow, mine are always so bitter, mine are so bad. Try growing them during a different time of year. Find the sweet spot in your region for root vegetables. If you, if you tried them and you didn't like them, try them during a different time of year. Try them in a different set of circumstances. Roasted root vegetables are so much better. Roasting radishes completely changes the flavor. Quarter them, oil, salt, pepper, 400-ish degree oven, roast them for 25 minutes till the edges get kind of brown and maybe you have some crispy bits and they're soft. They don't taste like radishes at all. They taste a lot more like potatoes. Rutabagas, roasted rutabagas are really good. Uh, you can do like rutabaga fries with them. I like rutabagas mashed. Peel them quarter, boil, and then mix in sour cream and chives. Oh, they're so good. I prefer mashed rutabagas like that over mashed potatoes. Mm, I really like potatoes. <laughs> Can I have both, please? Like, that's what I really want. They are so good, though. They are on par with mashed potatoes, I should say that. I, and I had never even eaten a rutabaga until I started growing them in my garden. It's kind of one of those things that just kind of opened up the world of possibilities to me. And I've tried a few different types of rutabagas. There's a yellow variety I really like, but the American Purple Top is just like a really solid classic rutabaga that I really like. And then beets. Beets, again, something that people, I think they just have a really bad rap because a lot of times the only beets anybody's had are pickled, which I have come to like pickled beets. I can handle them. But the way that I like beets the most is, again, like slice them into bite-sized pieces put some oil on them, some salt and pepper, roast them. And then if you make a sauce, get like Greek yogurt or something like, I like Greek yogurt. If you don't like Greek yogurt, you could just use regular plain yogurt. And like some dill in it, maybe something to brighten it, lemon juice or maybe some sort of vinegar or something like that. And mix that together and then drizzle that over roasted beets. Oh, it's so good. And with beets, they there are different levels of geosmin in them so you know that smell when you go outside and it's just rained and it smells like the earth outside what that is is there's actually a chemical compound in the soil called geosmin and it releases after the rain that's the smell after the rain geosmin is actually present in beets and so people are like i don't like beets they taste like dirt they taste like geosmin which is the smell after the rain and different types of beets varieties have different levels of that chemical compound so like kioja beets are ones that are like really high in that so they're earthier and from what i remember the golden beets are one that is the lower and so when you roast these you're going to caramelize the sugars and you're going to get a sweeter root vegetable rather than that really earthy taste and then i like doing the yogurt sauce because i think it kind of tones it down more i don't mind earthy taste really but i know why that's a turn off to people but that's what it is and I think I mean sometimes maybe just knowing that is enough to be like you know maybe I judged these too harshly maybe I was imagining soil but if I can imagine the fact that that's this the smell after the rain I kind of like that um what else do I have I got a few things here that are just standalones the moon and stars watermelon uh, this is one of the prettiest things I think that grows in the garden. It's this this dark, dark watermelon that has spots and there's usually, you know, like one or two real big spots and a bunch of little ones. So hence the name Moon and Stars. This is a really lovely melon. It's one that I love growing. Uh, the leaves also come in variegated. So it's just beautiful to watch grow, but it also tastes really good. And I have heard of people growing that in a lot of different regions. I know it does well in the South. Hill Country Red Okra. 
I would say this is my, if I had to choose one okra to be my favorite, it would be Hill Country Red or there's um, Alabama. It, it, they're all the same. Though it's different variations of the same variety. They're kind of like the squatty big ones. Um, I like these because when you cut them to make fried okra, you have these big old discs and you can kind of cut them thin. And it's just different than what you maybe have had at restaurants and stores and stuff like that. Okra is a southern thing. It loves heat. And so um, this is one of those things that as a southern person that has grown up here, it was wild to me when I started YouTube and learned that much of the country and even much of the world doesn't eat okra because it is one of my most favorite foods and something that um, I'm, I just love being able to grow. So if you have struggled with growing okra in the past, it is really important to move it out after the cold weather is passed. So if you, if you start this seed, like say you direct sow it when it's still getting pretty cold, not freezing, but pretty cold at night, um, it's probably gonna get stunted. It might not grow well. It's really best, like our last frost is early April and I am not gonna direct seed okra until probably May, um, until I know that the evenings are getting warm. You can start it from seed. If you live in a long season place, it's really not necessary because it's not gonna take off growing until it gets warm anyway. But if you wanted to grow this in a place that didn't have as much of a season, you would probably need to start this from seed keep it warm in pots until it got warm enough outside to move the plants out. Um, and even still, I, here where it's hot, we don't really start harvesting okra until later in the summer. And then it takes off. We had okra plants that were like 16 feet tall this year because they, they took off. I did get one lone pack of Black Beauty eggplant. I've grown a lot of different types of eggplants. I have learned that I like the look of eggplant like the fancy kinds, they have like the long skinny ones and the like all different, all different kinds and shapes and stripes and all that stuff. Um, I actually think they're cooler looking than I like eating them. The way that I like to use eggplant, those don't make as much sense. So Black Beauty is probably the most common type of eggplant. Like if you're gonna go buy an eggplant at the store, a lot of times Black Beauty is available. But it's kind of one of those things. This is popular for a reason because you get much larger fruits. And to me, whenever you don't want a bunch of skin on them, the larger fruits are getting more mass for the fruit without skin. And so I like doing like eggplant parmesan. Um, there's a casserole I really like to do. It's kind of like a take on ratatouille. When she uses eggplants and zucchinis and tomatoes and onions and um, you layer everything and put oil on it and garlic and thyme and then you slow cook it for like two hours and just keep mashing it down and let it get kind of caramelized on top. And for that, I don't want a bunch of eggplant skin in it. So I like the bigger fruits for that. So Black Beauty is kind of what I've settled on as my favorite eggplant to grow. I did get purple tomatillos. Tomatillos, there's not a ton of tomatillo varieties. There are a handful, but like all the seed places, I mean, they, they, they don't, it's not like tomatoes where you can have hundreds of varieties. It's usually purple, there's verde, which is green. Um, you know, you have a handful of varieties. Do know that if you are going to grow tomatillos, you have to have at least two plants. So again, you'll have, I have people come and say, I try to grow tomatillos and they would set flowers, but they never made fruit. You have to have two plants. They have to have something to pollinate with. It's not like tomatoes or peppers that self pollinate. You need two plants. Um, and so I always plant at least three or four in case something happens to one, because in the case of you only plant two and something happens to one, well, you lost both of them because one's not gonna produce on its own. We also do ground cherries, which I already had plenty of seeds for ground cherries, so I didn't order any. Um, which that's like a cherry tomatillo. You don't have to have two plants for those. I don't know why, but those will grow with just one plant, but we really like ground cherries also. I'm saving the tomatoes and peppers for last because that's what I ordered the most of. I got Blue Lake pole beans. I've tried lots of different green beans. Um, I can't say for sure that I have like a most favorite, but Blue Lake pole beans, there's bush and there's pole of Blue Lake beans and neither one of them has ever done me wrong. Like they grow well. And this year I'm planning on doing kind of a larger area with shelling beans and peas. And I was thinking that I might do like one really long row of like cattle panel trellis and do like one type of green beans, which will likely be the blue lake pole, just cause I know that they do well here. So when you are deciding what green beans to grow, 
Um, pole beans are essentially like you'll look at other things like tomatoes and you've got determinate and indeterminate. Um, potatoes come in determinate or indeterminate varieties. Squash, you've got vining squashes, which we are typically our winter squashes, and then bush squashes, which are typically our summer squashes. Um, not always, but somewhat. Determinate varieties, which are your bush varieties, typically all come to fruition around the same time. Whereas indeterminate varieties or pole or vining um, typically will ripen at different times. So if you're wanting to can, a bunch of green beans grow 40 foot row of bush variety because you're going to be harvesting all of those in like a week if you're wanting to be able to go out three times a week and pick enough green beans to come in and make dinner for your family of six fresh that's where you're looking at pole varieties now i'm talking about growing a long enough row that I'll probably be picking these enough that I'll need to preserve them. A lot of times it comes down to space, whether you're gonna grow pole beans or bush beans, but more often what is causing you to decide pole beans versus bush beans is what you're wanting to do with them, so. Now, I got dried beans this year from In My Gardener. I got this Mayflower bean, very old variety. Its arrival was cultivated in the Carolinas to the bean that we know today, I thought, that's cool. This kind of came over and became a variety in the United States through the Carolinas, which is where we are. So I thought that was really cool. This is a climbing variety. So again, I was imagining having a really long row and the bean is just really pretty. Let me see if I can show you this. See, I just thought those were really nice. I have typically said in the past that I did not think dry beans were worth growing because when you're growing in a raised garden bed, the arch trellises, and let's say you're gonna grow one arch trellis of a dry bean like this, which is gonna be essentially like maybe five, six seeds per side, maybe a few more than that. If you, and, and once you harvest that and you shell all of those, you're gonna have like a quart of beans maybe, which is like for a family my size, that's, that's a dinner one time. So I've typically said I did not think dried beans were worth growing. This year I have a lot more space um, and last year we started playing with doing shelling peas and we did a shelling pea. Um, it's not widely available. It's something that we got locally. We'd like to, maybe in the future we'll make it widely available, but I so fell in love with the therapeutic act of shelling peas. And in the past I've always said, this isn't worth it. You can't grow much on a small space. It takes too much time to shell them and I kind of wrote them off. But my mind really changed on that this year. And so that's why I bought shelling beans. So I would like to do a really long row of the Mayflower beans. And then I would also like to do a really long row of these Calypso beans, also known as Orca beans. I grew them once on a trellis and of course got a handful, you know, like I didn't get very much because I didn't give very much space to it. But I have always thought that these were so beautiful. And I mean, it, you can see why they're called orca beans. They're just really, really pretty. Kind of have that whole killer whale, free willy look. And I want to do a long row of these because I have now seen the light on shelling beans. And I see that it's good to hedge in some room um, in your life for that kind of task. So we're going to be regrowing our chicken and dumplings, shelling peas, as well as a couple different kinds of beans in a larger space, be able to give it plenty of space. Cause you do have to grow a good deal of those kinds of things to really make it really truly worth it as far as food preservation goes. This is not exclusively what I'll grow next year, but these are ones that I wanted to make sure I had seeds for. First, uh, the coral bell, bell pepper. Um, I have grown this before and it does pretty well. If your bell peppers come in really, really tiny, they probably just need nutrition. So um, make sure that you're using some balanced fertilizer to feed those plants. Peppers are heavy feeders and a lot of times you get really small stunted fruit and it's just that that plant needed more nutrition. Giant Marconi, um, also sometimes called the sweet Marconi red. This is one of my favorite peppers. It's so, so good. Um, it comes in, it's really big. It has thick walls. It has kind of like this smoky, sweet flavor. The fruits, if the plant is well nourished, should be about eight inches long. So they're like really, really good size. This pepper makes a really great dried seasoning. Um, if you can, if you have access to a smoker and you can smoke these and then dehydrate them and grind them, really great seasoning. Uh, but 
It's also great grilled. I like eating them fresh. I like dicing them up and scrambling them in with some eggs, um, making like breakfast burritos or something like that. It's just fantastic. And it says here that it's disease resistant, which is really cool. I've never had any problems with diseases with them. That's one of my favorite ones. I also got the chocolate beauty pepper. Um, in my experience of growing chocolate beauty, it is a little bit thinner walled than the other bell peppers that I grew. But it is this beautiful dark brown once it becomes ripe. And I really like it. I like the interest that it adds and it's a good, good pepper. All these colorful bell peppers, colorful peppers, they're all gonna start green. You might not know that. I, I've been asked before, they're like, I, I tried to grow that and it grew green, just let it ripen. Pep, any pepper that you grow, you could eat it green. Um, you could eat the chocolate, the coral, any of these bell peppers, you could eat them green. In fact, bell peppers, if you go to the store and buy a green bell pepper, if you left that on the plant, it would turn probably red. It's not ripe yet. And it has a sharper flavor, it's just a different flavor. Any pepper that you grow, if you eat it green, you're just gonna get a different flavor. And then if you let it ripen, is usually where you're gonna get the sweeter flavor. Um, even in hot peppers, if you let them ripen, they sometimes get hotter, but they often get sweeter with the, the heat. So I encourage you to just play around with it, try them in different stages. Sweet banana peppers, my sweet Benjamin. This is his favorite pepper for sure. Hands down his favorite pepper. Maybe one of his favorite fruits in the garden. Uh, when I, I, I always grow sweet banana peppers for Ben because he will snack on them every day. He'll go out there and pick them and eat them. And then last, Jimmy Nardello, a sweet plant. It's not super sweet. It's kind of seasony. It's kind of just like a, it's a mix between what you would expect from like a green bell pepper eating that and a sweeter pepper. It's kind of in between there, I would say. Good frying pepper, good snacking pepper. And it's really good um, pickled because it's kind of thinner. And so if you want to add in a few peppers with like your pickled cucumbers or pickled carrots or whatever it is you're doing, it's a good one to do that with. Lastly, my stack of tomatoes. This last year we had contaminated soil in our high tunnel and I lost a lot of my tomato plants. I lost a lot of the varieties that I had started. The year before that we moved right as the tomatoes started coming on. So I have not experienced like a full tomato year in the last two years. That may be <laughs> influencing my tomato seed shopping. It may influence me whenever I go to start seeds and it may influence how much space I plan on giving tomatoes this year. Um, I, I went off tomatoes for a little while doing AIP. I have started reintroducing them back. We'll see how it goes. Hopefully I can eat them, but I'm gonna grow them. Uh, first, the triple crop. I grew a variety called climbing triple crop for a while. This one is slightly different than that variety, but this is also still a really good tomato. So I wanted to grow this this year. Uh, pink ox heart, that's a tried and true. I've had great experiences with that in the past. The Abe Lincoln tomato, again, this is one, some of the largest tomatoes I've ever grown were of the Abe Lincoln variety. Really cool heirloom, got a long backstory and grows really good fruit. Big Rainbow, uh, this is also one that some of my largest tomatoes I've ever grown were the Big Rainbow variety. It just does really well. It's really beautiful when you cut inside of it. It's like streaky orange and red. And this is one of those when I talk about unusual varieties, like I had never seen a street tomato before and it's got great flavor. If you've not had homegrown tomatoes, can I just please implore you to try growing some? Even, I will go as far as to say, even buying tomatoes at a farmer's market is not the same. I joke that store-bought tomatoes taste like disappointment. And frankly, I don't eat them. My most popular video on YouTube is how to grow great tomatoes. I love tomatoes. I love growing tomatoes. I love eating tomatoes. I could live off of a tomato sandwich in the summer. I, I love tomatoes. It's one of my favorite foods. I am the person that if I go to a restaurant and I will say no tomatoes, take them off the sandwich, take them off the burger, take them off whatever, like I don't want them. Like, and pe it's so funny because I'll go out to eat with people and I'm like, I thought you love tomatoes. And I'm like, I don't love those tomatoes. Those are not the tomatoes I love. <laughs> this is not the tomatoes I'm looking for. Because um, they taste like disappointment because you see it and you think, oh, this is going to be my favorite food. And you taste it and you're like, mm, this is not my favorite food. I have had multiple people tell me that they didn't like tomatoes and then come snack on some directly out of the garden and be like, whoa. I thought I didn't like tomatoes, but I like this. If tomatoes are picked green off the plant. 
it'll still ripen but there are gases that are produced when it starts to blush on the plant that completely change the flavor and so to get that really rich flavor they need to start ripening on the plant if you need to pick them off at that point i think you still get a pretty good flavor however tomatoes grow in the summer it's hot and if you can pick your tomatoes in the middle of the afternoon on a hot day when they haven't been watered in a couple of days what happens is is that all of the sugars are then very concentrated and so that is when you're going to get like that crazy good flavor that is just you can't find it anywhere else the only way that you're going to get that is to have access to a garden where you can pick a ripe tomato in the middle of the afternoon and i will take a box of salt out into the garden and my knife and i will sit down right there on the soil and cut open that tomato and salt it and have a moment <laughs> of joy oh and i need that i'm so excited for that next homestead tomato this tomato is not my favorite to just slice and eat but i like growing it because all of the the fruits are they're round uh, they're pretty uniform it still has like a really good classic flavor and it's a really good one for canning so that's why I like the homestead tomato if I'm gonna pick one of those with my salt box and have a moment it's gonna be one of those bigger heirlooms um, it can get little weird pockets and ridges and all that stuff so I like to have kind of both options so that I can can and eat fresh and you can can the heirlooms but sometimes you have to cut part of them off the, you know if they have weird spots German Johnson, really good classic heirloom red tomato. Aunt Ruby's German Green. You'll hear people talk about fried green tomatoes. People will think you have to get a green fry. You don't. You can take any tomato unripe off of a plant and fry it green. A fried green tomato is a fried unripe tomato. But there are varieties that are green. Aunt Ruby's is one of them. With these, you have to be careful that you're paying attention or you'll miss that they got ripe and they'll rot. Um, so they do change slightly, like the shade goes from like a brighter green to kind of like a little bit deeper green, but the way you tell is by squeezing them. So um, just gently squeeze them whenever you walk past and you'll start noticing when they soften up. And then you can also like lean down and smell them if, if you know, you have a sensitive sense of smell and you can tell that they're ripening based on the smell. I like Aunt Ruby's German Green though. It's very bright, whereas a lot of tomatoes have that that rich, like deep kind of umami flavor. Aunt Ger Ruby's German Green is more like a bright, maybe more citrusy, uh, maybe just more acidic, um, but I really like it. I like it on sandwiches and I really love to make a tomato sandwich where I take like three different colors of tomatoes that have three different profiles and like make multiple thin slices of each ones and stack them up. <sighs> Can y'all tell like that I'm struggling here? It's December and I'm like, it is seven months until I get to eat the things I'm talking about. Japanese black trifle. When I first met Luke, you know, my gardener, I asked him to give me some of his favorite tomato varieties and this was one of his favorites. And I have grown it a couple times now and there are some that I've grown in the past that I liked pretty good, you know, that maybe weren't necessarily standouts to me. This one was interesting because the shape, but I'm wanting to grow it here. I'm wanting to grow a lot of the things I've tried before again now that I'm living in a new place, in a new area, and see what happens. Brandywine Yellow. Uh, this is one I've not grown before. I also got the Brandywine Red. Brandywine is a potato leaf variety, which is just a different shape. Of leaf and they are known for being a little more finicky uh, brandy wines are usually one of the first tomatoes to get sick in the garden I haven't grown them in South Carolina this is based off my experience in Arkansas but my granddaddy always grew black brandy wines they were his favorite and so I like to grow them kind of in memory of him so I'm gonna try the yellow too Cherokee purple Cherokee purple is a really solid heirloom. It's probably the most, one of the most popular heirloom varieties and one of the most popular heirloom tomato varieties, as well as brandy ones. That's really popular also. It's got that flavor of like a deep reddish, they call them purple. It's not actually purple. It's just like dark red. And that gives you that smokier, more umami flavor. And I like Cherokee purple. I usually start a lot of these because I give plants to people and that's the one they want because that's the one they've heard of. Mortgage lifter. The story behind the mortgage lifter heirloom is that there was a man who actually paid off his mortgage selling these tomatoes. They were so productive and so good. I'm, I've never had like a crazy crop of them, but they are big. Like I have gotten some really big tomatoes from mortgage, mortgage lifter and they taste good. They're like just a good classic red. Here, champagne bubbles. This is a cherry tomato. I've never grown this one before, so this is new to me. Where 
Rarikawi? Rarikawi? Somebody tell me what they think. The New Zealand heirloom is a remarkable dwarf variety that will grow some of its largest fruits possible for such a small plant. I grabbed this one to try in the green stalk. Again, I like growing dwarf things in the green stalk. Never grown that before though. And then last, the Paul Robeson that we opened earlier. If I could only grow one tomato, which one would it be? And there's one called Dr. Witchies, Dr. Weish's, however you say it. I love it. It's very similar to Kellogg's Breakfast. So either one of those, they're pretty interchangeable. And then Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson is similar to Cherokee Purple. It's a smaller fruit. And it is the best tasting tomato I ever had was Paul Robeson. When I had a moment with the tomato uh, where I just, I, I think I cried. Like I really did. Now it was late season fruit, very hot in the day, hadn't been watered for a few days. I pulled one off, I took a bite of it and literally sat down because it was just so good. <sighs> I can't choose between those two because to me, if I had the Paul Robeson and one of those orange tomatoes, I have what I need. Like in those two, but I can't just choose one. I can't do it. Sorry, I can't. That is my seed haul. So this is about 50 packages. So this is about $100 worth of seeds. I guess if you use a discount code, you could get a handful more than that. But yeah, this is a solid amount of food. It's amazing to me that right now, in this one little eight by 10 bag, I have essentially hundreds and hundreds of pounds of food right here. And all it needs is my care, it needs some good soil, some sunshine, some water, and I could feed my family. I mean, just the amount of food right here in my hands when you think of tomatoes being canned and frozen and you think of peppers going up and being seasoning powders and you think of dried beans and sweet peas and all the roots and the melons and all the herbs. I mean, the amount of food that could be produced out of this, this money is incredible. And to really think about the fact that there are enough seeds here that probably easily three or four home gardeners could split these packages. And then for $25 each have this much variety of food to grow still a very substantial garden. It's amazing. I love seeds. I have a lot of information about seed starting out there. Um, if you are at this point in the winter thinking about buying seeds and you're like, I don't know, I've never done it before. Um, I'd love to hold your hand through that process. Uh, again, make sure you sign up for the email list. Check out rootsandrefuge.com. I have blog posts about it. I have lots of older videos about seed starting, going through the process, and I'll be sharing my process with you this spring in seed starting. It's not that hard. Yes, there is a learning curve. Yes, you're gonna have to set reminders. You're going to have to maybe be a little bit more mindful than you are normally as a person. I'm a very forgetful person, but I managed to start seeds just fine. I set a lot of alarms on my phone so I don't forget to water them. Like that's truly how I, I have managed as a person that has a hard time focusing and sticking with something. I mean, I start seeds. If I can do it, you can do it. I promise you that right now. Don't make it a bigger deal than it is. Don't put it in your mind as something that's impossible. It's maybe there's a hard aspect to it. There's a, I don't even like calling it hard. Seeds want to grow. I mean, you really just have to give them what they need to grow. But even if it was hard, you can do hard things. Like you're, you can do it. You can start seeds. You can save a lot of money putting your garden in, split a seed order with your friend, buy from somewhere like in my garden that does $2 packs, use the coupon code just 10. You can have hundreds and hundreds of pounds of food for a very small investment. So that's it. Thanks for opening my seeds with me. I look forward to growing them with you. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. Uh, bless you. Until next time.